This is episode number 54 of the Web Platform Podcast. Today on our panel, we have Justin Ribeiro. Hello, wonderful people. Uh, Dan Buckner. Hey. Danny Blue. Hey, everybody. And myself, Eric Isaacson. And today we're going to be talking about web components, and we have three um, sure. awesome guests. We have Rob Eisenberg. Hey there. And uh, Wilson Page. Hi. And Chris Hallman, is that correct pronunciation? Yes, for a change it is, yeah. Sweet. <laughs> so can you guys uh, introduce yourselves in that order, I guess? Okay. Uh, my name is Rob Eisenberg, and uh, I am the project lead for Aurelia, which is a next-generation uh, web front-end framework. And uh, obviously we're doing a lot of work with, maybe not obviously, but we are doing a lot of work with web components and uh, surrounding technologies. So we're very interested in the future of uh, where that's going. Hi, my name's Wilson. Um, I work at Mozilla on the Firefox OS project. Um, we're using a lot of web components in production, and I've been involved in a few of the uh, spec discussions. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to see where they go. Hello, I'm Chris Harmon. I'm from Microsoft. I work on the Edge team, and I've been running a panel on web components at the Edge conference the other day, and then wrote an angry article about how the state of components is, which partly inspired what's going on here. Yes, I love that article, by the way. <laughs> it was, it was really good because then I read the one that you wrote a long time ago, <clears throat> where you were saying praises about the the web components. Yeah, and and it was really I wanted to get people together because I know that. Um, a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to. I don't want to start playing with web components because there's a lot of hype. Some people feel like um, some larger companies are pushing it down people's throats and forcing it. And you know, I wanted to get like a realistic perspective on things to see where we're at and where we're headed, and um, things that we've learned from the past that uh, we should really fix now. So, um, with that said, what are your what are your thoughts, Christian? Uh, I was kind of disappointed by the state of it because we um, it was partly a configuration of things. Like right? when, when we started with web components, we said like, okay, here's a video element in a page. What is actually all these things? What are these buttons? What's going on there? And we wanted to make people aware that this is also HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and that features in the browser are actually built this way. And then we said like, oh, why don't we extend the browser that way? Why don't we allow for widgets like tab groups and these kind of things that are not specified in HTML and have a, a a full lifetime span of like inter initializing that, sending that, and going out of it. And now we're at a stage where we're like, yeah, this is halfway through. After four years later, after it's been or two years later, after it's been said, like this is the thing we need. We're still at a stage where it's like, okay, you need these twelve libraries to make it work, and the difference between different browsers is holding us back. And then we started like instead of having HTML imports where we build web components and import them like you would include a style sheet or you would include a script, we now say okay we need to use E6 modules for that, which is a different spec altogether and a different kind of thing altogether. It's not it's not markup based. It's like out of a sudden the simplicity of what we wanted to do with web components became a thing. Now you have to be a JavaScript expert as well and have to do it in JavaScript rather than just put an element in your page. So I thought we lost a bit of the original vision of web components and we got far too excited in about componentizing everything, which reminds me of, of larger platforms like .NET or Mono or even PHP includes that we had in the past. So I think we're, we're losing a bit of focus of what we want to achieve with web components. And um, I think when it comes across browsers, we're still far too far away from being able to use them without the aid of uh, React or, uh, or other platforms. So you mentioned something there, which is actually a, a big sticking point for me personally, which are HTML imports. Um, they, they, in their current state, well, partially it's support, right? So all the browser vendors getting behind what imports are. Um, and I know I've talked about it before here about some inherent issues with the way that imports work, just the semantics of it. Um, and I think Aurelia, actually, um, Rob can speak to that obviously much better than I can. I think they actually have a different syntax. So like there, you you can't. It, there's no naming of something that you import because an HTML import can be anything, right? It can be CSS 
there can be JavaScript in there. There's obviously HTML, but with this dream of building, you know, tens of thousands of of components, and that's and people get to import all these things. I mean, you're going to run into naming collisions, and right now there's no good way to achieve. There, there, right now there's no good way to handle that. And imports, it's it just throws everything on page, and whoever whoever gets there first gets it. So, do you think that? Maybe fixing isn't the right word, but maybe like getting everybody more on board with imports will help. Will will help go towards that, back towards that original vision. Yeah, I think the problem is that we have a JavaScript as well. If you have a function with one name in another script, it's the same function. Just the second one overrides the first one. And uh, I think the other problem, of course, with HTML imports was performance because they were all uh, they were all synchronous rather than asynchronous. So that was another thing to fix in this case. Um, I think we're, it's better off with uh, with imports, but um, as I said, do we actually by using the thing that makes much more sense uh, in terms of like technical clarity, uh, do we put the uh, do we push the entry point far too high? Like uh, people should people know about all kind of ES6 before they actually use a web component, or should they just be able to use a component by writing an import? I think the import and uh, and uh, custom element feature was something that was very natural to somebody who writes HTML. But then again, the question is, do people still write HTML, or are we past that stage by now? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> that, is, that brings up a good point. The big push today is to have all of these preprocessors and build steps, and you know, compilation and transpilation is, is sort of like required now. Um, and I mean, imports in particular, too, there's, there's some issues with those as far as that goes, because we have you know, the the HTML, uh, not the HTML, the ES6 module loaders. And my understanding is that if we were to implement them tomorrow, right, you couldn't do any of these custom elements. They couldn't register themselves, right? And I think that's why they're in the head. Am I, am I correct in that? They, they, sh they would still work correct. What you, is it because the modules are loaded asynchronously? Exactly. Because it's, it, so it is, my understanding was it was synchronous. It's an interesting point because right now that does work. You can lazily instantiate components, so you could have an X foo tag on the page, and then at the end of the body, like you could have a something that loaded the definition of that component, and it would work. Um, but this is something that's being spoken about uh, and was spoken about heavily in the face to face last week. Um, that um, so the the end goal is to align. Um, custom element definitions with ES6 classes. Um, and that would involve having all your instantiation logic inside the constructor instead of the created callback. Um, so that would mean that as, as the parser hits the tag, it, the element would get, in, uh, it would get created straight away instead of what happens today where the parser hits the tag, um, it becomes some kind of weird halfway. Um, it's, not a, it's not an X foo, it's just something that's not defined, some HTML element. And then it hits the register element later on in the in the document, and then the prototype gets swizzled, which is the term that's being used, uh, whereby the element then becomes something different, and then the creator callback gets called, which uh, apparently de developers don't have much of an issue with, but the uh, platform devs and spec people really hate this, and they want to um, explain the platform and say, hey, you know the video tag, the video tag's created with a uh, all its logics in the constructor, and it gets created at parse time. And the end goal is to try and have customers do the same. Uh, yeah, that's apparently it's super tricky. <laughs> that second that's pass it. is something that I remember. You know, I, gosh, I remember talking about that two years ago. That's the exact same flow, and you know, kind of the the devil that is both choices, uh, because you know, you, you really want to get the stuff out there, but then you don't want to make it, you know, rely on all these other things. And I'm curious. Now that ES6 is out there, does everyone here on the panel feel that that's still an issue? You know, now that it's you know ES6 is close and we have polyfills, I don't know how much what a polyfill would look like. You know, it probably look a lot the same as it does today. But is that still a concern, or, or what do you think? Isn't that slightly the crux of the whole thing? The problem with the template element, for example, is that you cannot polyfill it. The idea of a template tag is that it doesn't do anything when JavaScript is not available. But as a browser that doesn't understand the template tag would still render the content of it as an invalid element. It would just say, like, okay, that's, I don't know what it is, I'll just show it to you. 
So you can't even polyfill that because you cannot just overwrite it because it gets rendered on the first flow. It's supposed to be inert content. And inert content has never been defined in the parser before except for a script element with a type that isn't defined. That's how we did the templating before the template element. So the whole concept of like having a custom element in there and then having the custom element definition overriding what it is is in essence just progressive enhancement of a div element and making it something else. Like it's, uh, you will have a flash of unstyled content, all kind of problems with that one. Whereas like a video element gets rendered when the page encounters it and it's not becoming a placeholder and then becomes a video element. So the when in the runtime this becomes the functionality is the question there and. I myself, I don't have a problem with that. Um, the other thing, of course, is like when you say ES6 is ready, it's like, yeah, it is, but where it is on runtime. Most of the time, you have to use a transpiler to, to use ES6 as well. So um, making the components dependent on the, on the availability of ES6 in the browser is another interesting loop that's going on. But a much more, um, to me, a much more interesting one, because, for example, iOS 9, Safari has a good ES6 support, but I don't know what its support of, like, web components is at all. So I think the push with ES6 across browsers is going much faster than the one that we had with the web components back. So maybe that's the right way of doing it. Yeah, they only support template currently. Yeah. It's actually, it's actually been Apple that have been pushing the hardest for, these, for the alignment with ES6 on, on custom elements. Um, so it's interesting that they want to see that fixed, but then, so I, I don't think they're happy with the the upgrade, the lazy upgrade um, thing that we have right now. Um, so it seems like that if we did go with synchronous constructors, um, we would need something to say, or the user would need something to say, hey, by the way, my my um, element element definitions have now loaded. Can you please take a second pass? And they'll do the upgrade manually or something funny like that, but. Can I talk a little bit about, so my perspective on all this is a bit different because I'm, a, I'm actually a framework author building on top of these specs and a lot of, or a number of the things that we've built uh, with Aurelia actually has to do with addressing pretty much all these issues on top of the existing specs. So, <clears throat> and, it's, and it's actually hard to talk about them because there's these different specs and but they all sort of tend to <laughs> relate uh, problems with one or problems with another. But um, so the element upgrading uh, issue, for example, one of the things that we do is um, is is we actually we use HTML imports, but that's only uh, but the actual load of our views is also passed through an ES6 loader. So we kind of patch things up to try and uh, merge them together, and we have this pipeline uh, for any anything that we're importing into that allows us to scope uh, what is being imported into that view. So we sort of solve the scoping issue, but, but what also gets solved as part of that as well is that um, we, we basically have this way of uh, speaking sort of web components uh, terminology instead of our specific terminology. We have this way of knowing when, say, a template is ready to be instantiated. And so uh, if I were to imagine this in terms of web components, it would be the ability to import things not into the just into the document, but into a template, and then to ask a template when it's ready to render. And that and at that point, you then have the ability to synchronous, synchronously actually instantiate everything that's in that template. So this is actually what Aurelia does uh, behind the scenes: is you build your app in terms of these views. Individual views can import what they need, and when a view is parsed we determine its dependencies, asynchronously load them, and that all happens before, uh, before at some point down the line, a synchronous instantiation of that view happens. And so I'm wondering, maybe we can, maybe there's some way that we can, uh, in the specs, have this synchronous instantiation of templates that allow the synchronous constructors to work, but maybe to let a developer say, like, uh, maybe they designate that some fragment of their DOM uh, is has some scope to it, and it has its imports in it. So, because there, because there is this issue of, you don't also want to delay the entire rendering of a page to wait for all the web components uh, to, to run. So we've got that issue in your traditional apps as well. So maybe most of their view is maybe uh, it's standard HTML, but maybe what they can do is tag certain parts of their view as asynchronous, and then the imports can load asynchronously, and then once the runtime knows that those pieces have loaded it, then can synchronously evaluate that fragment of the DOM. 
I'm just this is kind of off the top of my head. This uh, it's handled entirely different with Aurelia, so we don't have these issues. Um, but maybe yeah, so that's that, way that you... sounds like a, that sounds like a pretty good solution. And I think I think um, if you if you think of it how you use JavaScript today, like and you're using say require JS async loader, you and you want to use some function from a module, like you're not going to try and call that function before it's been loaded. So right. um, I think developers do kind of have that. Uh, model in their head already that like, hey, I've got to wait for this thing to be loaded before I use it. So the upgrade thing, the upgrade prototype swizzle thing is cool because it's a bit more robust. Um, but maybe it's maybe it's uh, it's going to introduce a lot of corner cases that uh, frameworks and stuff are going to have problems with. So. Do we feel like with frameworks though, and and libraries in particular? Um, I mean, because I I love using using Polymer. And uh, I started playing with Angular 2 now, and Aurelia. Um, do you think that it's too much overhead for them to to put this stuff in? And you know, one of the things I've found with with some of this, like like Polymer, um, <clears throat> which I love using, but sometimes I <clears throat> I wonder if I could decouple things if there was you know better performance uh, if we implemented a lot of that natively, because um, you know I've been I've been ex experiencing some pain with with certain abstractions uh, for specific elements that are not ne not necessarily upgraded to a version of the framework or the library. I think that's always the problem with frameworks, isn't it? We get the functionality right now, but we get it at the cost of being simulated. So it's up to the frameworks to stay up to date and actually when it becomes natively supported to use the native one rather than keep simulating it and of course then it keeps then it uh, brings, puts the onus on the people who use these frameworks to upgrade their frameworks which sadly enough doesn't work a lot of times as well so um, uh, I think the, the a framework is a great opportunity to to feature these tests and to, to test these features and to kick the tires off them and uh, maybe that's something that we should be concentrating on a bit more to actually make all the frameworks align and make the spec coming from that one rather than like asking people to use it because when we did at EdgeConf which is the cream of the crop in terms of developers when we asked people who uses them natively not a single one did then when I, after my blog post a lot of people started tweeting me and sending me emails that internally they're using native uh, web components but it was mostly in content management systems behind the scenes so on runtime a lot of people don't do them yet so I, I agree that like uh, inside libraries is probably a good idea to actually test these features and find out the main solutions. As if Aurelia has a good solution for that and proposes it back to the spec, why not? You know, I've seen some components that are um, that are native, you know, just regular web components, vanilla web components from IBM. That's the only web component group I've seen that's totally, totally like that. That's out there for open source, but. I mean, when I first started playing with web components a while ago, that's what I wanted to do because that was the power of it, right? You're not depending on something else, and I feel like frameworks it shouldn't have that burden to to have to to put that in there. But it is a good experimental ground. You bring up a good point. It makes them. It makes you wonder. I mean, like if you uh, a lot of web components are web components are are. are components, they're modules, they're like, they have a lot of stuff in them, so when you say like, I don't want to use a lot of stuff, a lot of times you use a, a component and then it loads a lot of stuff in the background, lots of scripting, and we have of course the problem if we had components across browsers, they probably would have jQuery in every single one of them, although it's rather, it's already on the page, which is an issue. Um, but inside the uh, inside the frameworks, as you say, it's my bigger problem is that we, instead of telling people you can use web components by using Polymer, by using React, by using Aurelia, or whatever, we just tell people you start a new app. We start a new app by um, by uh, by starting with that framework. So we make the frameworks a dependency rather than a helper. And I think that is where the weirdness comes in because we get far too excited of pushing uh, our products to people rather than like making the thing work in the browser. Well, so one thing that... that you know You're not talking. <laughs> You're just beeping. Okay, that's <laughs> not just me. Alright, good. Ah. I was about to say, I'm going crazy. <laughs> Well, you're working with web components. What do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> now it's that devil bad. sounds. It's that WebRTC component again. Is this is this better? That's yes. so yeah, okay, much cool. better. 
Yeah, you so, don't, you know, you one don't of the things... like the one in, like, the... Uh, it was like Attack of the Body Snatchers, you know, the, like... <laughs> <laughs> don't do that again. <laughs> I thought it, maybe it was these giant horns going off at this hackathon behind me. But, um, yeah, I know, we... You know, when I look at li from the library author perspective, you know, this... I, I kind of I don't worry too much about the, the libraries only because I hope that people are genuine, the browser vendors are genuine when they say that we want to innovate, you know, based on what the community does and at a faster pace. Because I see web components as a really good substrate. You know, they're they're pretty basic right now as far as what a custom element does. It's just a lot of hooks that you didn't used to have. But I hope over time we start adding things like Christian talked about the you know tap groups and all these other things, and it gives you a really good entry level foundation for building what really needs to be the next sort of wave of what web apps are. And that's, you know, more complex design interactions and UI, and it can be based on web components. You know, we can start adding, like, like people talk about React a lot um, and these frameworks. And my thing with React, I love the guys that work in React. I actually coded Mutual's Core with Sebastian and those guys back in the day. Um, so, I, you know, they're, they're friends of mine. But I think to myself, you know, maybe in the future we have web components and then we take like the three or four core things out of React that are interesting and that do a good job and we add them as add-ons to web components. And I, so I, no matter what, I still see it as a, as a really good foundation. Does that make sense or? Kind of. It makes sense yeah, to me. I mean, the thing is the, the reason people build frameworks and libraries is because they see a deficiency in the core platform that relates to their real-world scenarios. I mean, and um, in, in our case, it's it's some of its capabilities that we feel that are missing, but some of it is uh, actually really around the story of develop, developer experience or or the process of how one puts together a large-scale app or some of these other kinds of things, which maybe the browser tech maybe is never. Uh, intended to uh, solve because these can be very opinionated type things. So there's a mixture of, of things. I think that I could see what I would love to see happen at least is as web components evolve for people working on implementing and specking to look out at the array of frameworks and saying like, okay, what is, what is being done well out there that is meeting a real world need by developers? And is this something that is generally applicable that we could maybe with some massaging, if you will, kind of reimagine on top of the native web stack? I mean, I, so I think that it makes a lot of sense to look at, you know, what is React doing? What is Aurelia doing? What is Angular doing? Are there any pieces that are generally applicable and could they or should they be folded back into the core platform? It's kind of a difficult line to walk, though, because also all these frameworks, like I said, they also have their own, usually have pretty strong opinions, and those go beyond core capabilities but more into methodologies or approaches to uh, app development or team culture even. All those kind of philosophies about those things kind of are usually in the framework too. Uh, but I, I, I mean, I think that should definitely be the process. I mean, like I said with Aurelia, we're, we use uh, several of the Web Components technologies. We make several of them optionally usable, and then, but we pretty much hack on top of all of them because, um, like, in, in our opinion, none of them are really quite right for uh, building apps, you know, um, the way that, you know, I've been building apps and the way that our community has been building apps uh, for years. So, so those are, that's where the deficiencies come in or whatnot that we have to kind of patch up. Uh, but that, that should definitely feed back into the process. I don't know what that would look like or how that would happen, um, uh, but... I think that's a good source of of raw material, if you will, to be refined uh, for the platform for the the real web platform itself. I'm also pretty worried about this because we speak a lot about like what we as developers need and what we as developers work like and how we build apps for years. And when I then look at the state of the mobile web and the applications that we have out there, it's awful. It's like a lot of the performance is absolutely terrible. We the, the things are much too big than what they should be. Could we use native uh, uh, functionality in the browser? Because we just put it on top of a framework that made us feel better and made us say like we can build more. Uh, the question is like, do we need to build more or do we need to build better? Because I've seen uh, when I see, for example, a, a Facebook running in React, it's a massively complex thing to work, but the performance of it is just like. Uh, on, a, on, a, on an older computer is terrible and it's like it's because we simulate in older browsers what the new browsers have so maybe an approach to 
uh, to have like have a simpler interface on older machines and a, uh, and a more complex one using progressive enhancement is something that makes sense. But I don't know any of the frameworks that do that because it comes from a like here is how we would do it in Java or here is how we would do it in .NET and now we can do this on the web as well and the end product. Okay, we optimize it for you. Please trust us. Our opinionated approach that this is going to be the best app that you can have at the end. So we we we're kind of disengaged from the end product as developers by going through these things that make our lives easier. But I, I'm I, I'm I'm kind of worried that we're losing touch with the web that way because we just we see it as a rendering platform or as, a, as an end platform to render to rather than something to build on. And well, is this a blind spot for Chris? I mean, is it a blind spot for developers? Have we you know, so often before we had said, okay, well, I want to use feature X that's in the pipe. I'll use a polyfill. And now everyone seems to lean towards the framework because I'm going to use this framework to resolve all my problems, which creates, in a lot of cases, slowness because, one, it's a complex framework. They may not have a great deal of understanding straight away, which means you have to learn a framework and how to eke out every bit of performance. I mean, are, are, are we losing this notion of, I just want to polyfill this feature? And I think even more that the frameworks themselves don't do poorly feeling internally. You know, instead of just instead of just seeing what the platform is that it's running on, that it is a, an Edge browser or is it a Chrome, and then I don't need to do use the, the polyfill, but I just use the native implementation. But that means making the framework much more complex as well. And most framework developers are busy just keeping the thing alive and keeping new putting new features in that people request again that developers request and not end users request. So the uh, the problem with polyfilling is that like I mean it's a British term that means like you put a, you put a hole in, you have a hole in the wall you paint over it so but it should in, in essence you should fix that hole sooner or later and polyfills had a tendency to stay a lot to stay around and not get updated and not get removed and the same with like PhoneGap. PhoneGap was meant to be a stopgap solution until the web has native capabilities which the web never got so we we we, we don't let people uh, let things evolve inside the frameworks themselves and I think this would be a massive change and this would be a massive boost if we allowed inside frameworks to to uh, to promote browsers better that actually do it rather than just simulate it for everybody. And now we just swizzle it all together. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you that Aurelia that's definitely fair. does do that. So <laughs> we use every native capability that's present or or fall back to polyfills if it's if it's not there. I mean, we're, we try and stay pretty much on top of everything, but uh, it's I mean, expensive. It's it costs a lot yeah. of man, man hours, doesn't it? It's not too bad. It's not too bad. It's cheaper than I don't know, you know, because the speaking of expensive and man hours, I mean, again, a lot of the times people choose to use a. I lost you. Can't hear you, Rob. Budget to work within. There we go. Okay, try again. So, no, I was saying people may choose a framework because uh, it fits well with the type of app they're building or their corporate culture, and it's going to allow them to be more agile, perhaps than if they were building straight on top of the raw platform. And they know that I've only got a month to develop this or whatever. And, uh, you know, people choose these things for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes it's opinions. Sometimes it's corporate culture. Sometimes it's a matter of, you know, we get people that contact us, for example, that um, are just building lots of line of business apps that are coming off of having, like, a legacy, say, Silverlight app, you know, that's like 100,000 lines of... C sharp code, and they're trying to figure out how to get off this dead platform and get to the web. And they're looking for higher level pieces because they're not, they're basically building things like forms over data and these kinds of apps. Uh, and so they're looking for higher level pieces. These kind of people are just trying to get to the web and get off of their legacy stuff. And they oftentimes don't even know anything about web components, to be honest. Um, so you've got this wide range of people out there and companies in all these different situations that are coming from all these different perspectives. So, uh, I, I mean, obviously, I'm a framework author, so I'm going to be pro-framework, but um, I think that it's, it's unfair to say that they're not useful. <laughs> even, in a world, even in a world where web components are on version 3, and the and the browser has evolved much more significantly than today. There's still going to be a a good use for things like that because it aligns with the business specific business needs 
which may have nothing to do with core web tech per se. So I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's not useful. I, I think what my my big thing with React anyway uh, has been that initially, in, maybe a year ago, it was billed as well. We don't need web components because we've got React. When really, when you break it down, like web components work just fine in React. You can have you know components in React templates. And in my own working with stateless apps, you know, a one-way state um, sort of app that's built like that, uh, I have like a module I wrote that was like 100 lines. It does a lot of what Flux does, you know, some of those core pieces of React. And I really like it, but I also like using web components inside it because there's no reason you can't create a generic unit of functionality and have it used within your one-way bound app. So it, I, I think it was like a needless positioning to say it has to be one and not the other or, you, you know, you, just choose React because you know you don't need web components with it. When really it's like React is kind of good at these other things, and web components marry nicely with it. So it, I don't know if it was a branding thing or you know if it just happened that way, but it it pushed people off the idea that we need to innovate on that part of the web. Those those slow paths and those things that are crafty because we can just throw a glob of divs at it, and that's going to be fast as long as we just ignore the platform, right? Like. Right. That the, the way to get around these speed things and these bottlenecks is not to say, well, let's just work in this, this one little environment we have in script that we know is fast and tuned, and we'll just completely avoid that, and we'll encourage everyone else to write this React Native stuff that treats the web as a dumb target, and that we don't have to improve in certain areas. And that, that was, a, I guess, what I was most opposed to. And, and what oh, I, I would agree. Yeah. It's a branding marketing problem, isn't it? A lot of people use frameworks to make hacker news. So yeah, if I if I build it on top of that, then people are excited about my product because it's obviously the new, the new thing and the amazing thing. Um, and I, 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 yeah, I'm getting very tired of this, and I think it's a very big problem that we have right now. And I'm talking tomorrow at the Web Forward event here about this to a degree that we we got into a world where we impress each other with the things that we do rather than thinking about the end product. And uh, Every, every framework or every solution and every polyfill that comes out has to fix every problem. Like when we go back to say like you have different constituencies, you have different people that are just having data or forms over data and want to go on the web. Yeah, this framework will work for those guys and for the ones who want to build a blog and for the ones who want to build a to-do list and for the ones and so on and so on. I think uh, we, we should think much more as a tool chain of, uh, uh, of different solutions to get where we want to go rather than like every single time a new framework comes out, it's just like, that's the end of necessity of web, web components or web standards because now you can only start doing things with that. And when I look at, at a JSX file, for example, it scares me having like the HTML, the, the, the look and feel and the functionality in the same file. That's, if you write that in HTML, people will slap you. But uh, if it's, as it's pre-rendered, it's a cool thing out of a sudden. And we've done that with .NET, we've done that with other platforms, and it keeps that like if you uh, if you modularize into includes then it's a better way of doing it because the whole CSS uh, uh, cascade and stuff is confusing and uh, and global scoping is a real problem so we still haven't fixed the scoping problem uh, of web components at all and I think that's something we should revisit because it, it is beneficial for the web Scope. yeah one Oh, sorry. No, okay. I was, I was scoping is a huge de for me anyway. It's a huge deal in web components, and like um, Rob was saying, where you have to build, kind of build on top of these other things to actually fit your real world scenarios. That's a big one. We touched on it a little bit before, but everything being in the global scope is it inevitably is going to cause you problems, especially as you start building you start building larger apps and you're like things are happening somewhere and I don't know what's happening which is why just things like like modules you know common js and and require now you know es6 with you know babel or um uh tracer or something like that are so important to have because yeah, I don't, and I don't why see they need couldn't. to be in web components too it it, it it it's it's to me it's an unavoidable it's an unavoidable problem that's going that'll it's going to have to be solved at some point. I mean, you can't like do document dot get element by id dot register element, right? That would be great if you could just scope it to another element, and then it's inside there. Anything you put inside there, you could do, you know, or even some shadow shadow root. 
Isn't that the same problem we have with JavaScript, though? Because we, with JavaScript, everything was global as well, and then we came up with functional patterns, then we came up with module patterns, then revealing module patterns, then we came up with namespacing, and then jQuery had the jQuery problem that every plugin tried to override another plugin with the same name. In, in essence, it's like there's no technical solution for that. It's just craft. It's like making sure that you actually know the naming of stuff that goes into it. And in a build process, if there's a name clash, do some renaming or some refactoring on the fly. That would be another solution to that problem. That very that very well might be the solution is to do it in tooling rather than you know rather than in the the um, the platform itself. But that doesn't really work though when you get mashup apps and you get these uh, dynamically composited apps. And if you're looking at down the future of the web, and how can you even know ahead of time in some cases what is going to be there? <laughs> so I, I think that that's a core platform issue. I mean the yeah, the uh, ECMA body has spent uh, a lot of work on ES6, and one of the big features of ES6 was going through to finally get modularization in the language. And to me, it, it seems that we should take that same concept and bring it into the DOM somehow, uh, officially, and that that should be a core platform uh, feature, because that's a, that's a fundamental enabler. I, I, I guess I just... You could do a bit of it with tooling. I don't think writing that tool would be very trivial. Um, and again, writing such a tool would probably be framework dependent because uh, you know you have to kind of make some assumptions about how people are putting their apps together. But I think it would be better served in the platform and be able to handle a much more robust set of scenarios, particularly, like I said, when you have these mashups and when you have uh, things that are a lot more dynamic in terms of uh, what actually ends up in the DOM at runtime. Uh, maybe it's not all sta uh, statically, you know, knowable, so to speak. Um, so, I, I, in my opinion, I think there's been a lot of work done on JavaScript lately. Um, I think that we should learn from them and see if any of what is in uh, what has happened with ES6 and what is sort of ongoing into the future there. We should learn from them and see if any of those concepts or any of those developments make sense uh, in the DOM world. You know, like imports, uh, the ES6 module loader, and scoping, and um, there's there's other things too. But I mean, I, I think that's an easy, easily identifiable one. And it's again, a lot of work. The, I, I'm not saying it's not a lot of work, uh, but I but I think it's important. No, no, there's a lot of work in JavaScript engines themselves to do optimization of JavaScript before the rendering in the JITs itself. There's, for example, at the, uh, at the Edge, uh, at the Edge uh, Summit, we had a talk about Brian Tell and about the Chakra engine, and he showed about inlining of JavaScript, that you, you, when you have a function that is actually called from another function internally, the JIT takes that function and makes it part of the other one to have one binary blob in the end. And if you put that across different import into different scripts, then it didn't work in the past. And now the new Chakra engine does that as well. So a lot of the uh, implementation in JavaScript engines itself, like in Odin Monkey or whatever it's called in Microsoft, uh, in Mozilla now, and in Chakra and in V8, would be interesting to take a look at that and uh, and see if we optimize too much in the uh, in our implementation and not let the JIT take over for these optimizations. Because a lot of the... A lot of the modernization of JavaScript that we did in the past worked against uh, making it fast on runtime. So it would be interesting to 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 promote this kind of uh, knowledge much more to the outside world than to the average JavaScript developer before they actually start trying to solve a problem that, after the fact, the browser will solve for them anyways. Chris, in your last article, you had a great quote that uh, that was, "We need to enable web developers to use vanilla web components." Right. So. Can you can you talk about that? Because to me, it just seems like like we're moving we're moving away from that right now. Well, it's basically because I'm old and I've been using the web for such a long time. And uh, I came from radio and I, I started using the web with, with Notepad and started writing things and looked at the specs and just started typing things in and things worked. And uh, uh, that was amazing. And I've been coaching and training people for the last 15 years. Here's how easy it is to get something started on the web. And not like, here's your C++ builder, or here's like your Visual Studio, and then you have to C-sharp, and here's 5,000 lines of code with 50 dependencies, and out of a sudden you have something on the screen. So the immediacy of web development, to me, was always a big success. Everybody become, become a publisher on the web. I think it's very dangerous when people say everybody needs to learn how to code, 
And I think if we, in 2016, 2015, you still have to learn how to code to publish something on the web, I think that we regressed. We regressed as a medium. We didn't regress as a technology platform, but as a medium we have a problem because this is for people who want to put things out there and get people excited about what they do. This could be an app, this could be a blog post, this could be a political statement when you're in Syria and the rest of the media is controlled by somebody. So making it very complex for people to use uh, things that perform well and to things that work well is something that I, I don't subscribe to. I don't, uh, I'm not coming from a computer science background. I'm not coming from a university background. To me, the more abstractions we put in, the, hard, the less people we have using that thing. Even, it doesn't matter if it's beautiful in the end, if, if it looks easy, but people are not happy relying on magic uh, or relying on things that they don't understand. And that's why I think we should push, try to push more forward to make this thing work without any of these uh, abstractions. But as I said earlier, if in the abstractions we can learn from it and kick the tires inside these abstractions, all the better. But um, Sooner or later, I think we should we should stop relying on them because no matter how much these things are supported right now, sooner or later, when the business case of a company changes, they might drop and fall through. And I I can show the battle scars of that because I worked on YUI. YUI two, YUI three was an amazing amazing platform. It had modelization. It had like independent parts of the page that were scoped to each other because we needed it for the Yahoo homepage back then, because Yahoo Finance had a different look and feel that Yahoo Sports had, that the Maps had, and every team wanted to have their part of the homepage independent of the others. So YOI 3 had this modularization and lazy loading and all these clever things in it. And nowadays, where is YUI? It's not even supported by, by Yahoo anymore. It's now thrown out to the community and say like, oh, please, the community will maintain it. And uh, communities don't maintain things if you don't guide them and you don't pay them and you don't make them feel welcome for maintaining it. You just get a free few people who are very excited or very uh, involved in it. So I think uh, relying on, on, uh, on frameworks, shims, and libraries are, is good to get immediate results, but we should push forward to making this thing work. And I found we lost that a bit after we've been rah rahing it a long time for web components. It's like, it's funny because I'm at conferences almost every week and I see this like, uh, schedule of talks and like these these the talk topics and the whole web components topic has spiked in the last few years and now it's getting less and less and all the talks I see about web components native web components right now is all about shit it doesn't work <laughs> like, we don't have the excitement anymore that we had before and I think we, we should push harder to make that excitement happen again how do we do that uh, so I'm like I know that's kind of a, 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 it's a terrible question and I apologize for it almost but at the same point, you know, I would love to be able to use, you know, native components um, at work now, but I can't. Like I, you know, based on, um, you know, based on project requirements and all these other things, I I can't. So if I want to use these things, I have to go somewhere else to get them. I have to go to something like Polymer or, you know, X or Y other things. I have to go that way. So how do we? So is one? How do we get? back up to the same levels of excitement without saying shit it doesn't work <laughs> and will that also help push more browser vendors I mean Safari is a is a big one now where with with um, a roadmap for native support for web components so will more developer were more will more people in the developer community talk yeah excuse me if more people in the developer community are talking about native vanilla components will that help push the browser vendors to start implementing these things natively faster the way that ES6 is starting to be pushed now I think it's mostly about wording and I'm very happy that we have somebody from Apple here discussing all these pro oh we don't um, I think the, the bigger issue is our wording about these kind of things like use react use use polymer and everything works and look how beautiful the design is and like how your components work we, we, we keep selling that dream of like here's the thing and it works and you don't have to worry about it and instead it would be interesting to see a few more talks we did this with polymer and under the hood it creates these com web components that could be natively used like this as well to show that these frameworks are being used to solve a current problem and not to replace a problem that is already we gave up on i think a lot of the messaging that we give right now is like it will not work ever without this kind of framework and here's why i'm excited about this framework and here's how fast we build something with it so that's the kind of worrying that I would love to see go away 
and uh, uh, but it's it's all marketing if you think about it. It's great for somebody like Facebook to have React. It's great for somebody like Google to have Polymer. It's great for people. It was the same with YUI. I mean, YUI was a great opportunity for us to hire people because they hit the ground running. They basically used the system that we used internally in Yahoo before they actually got hired. And I think with React and with Polymer, you have exactly the same thing. But we 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 can just cannot people we cannot expect people to use that one thing. That's the same thing that we thought with Flash and Silverlight. These 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 machineries use solved all of our problems. You could build beautiful things with the click of a button, and then half a year later you had these like threads of people who are like, oh my god, I'm now totally given up. I mean the the amount of very hurt Flash developers shooting at HTML5 every day because they've been abandoned by Adobe. Is huge, and I think that's t- that's partly understandable. I don't want to disappoint developers by saying like, okay, this works now, and then a week later, oh no, don't use that because it's actually not a solution anymore. So I think uh, giving the insight of how these frameworks re- would relate to native ones, and maybe doing some comparison and say like, okay, with React or, or with Polymer, this is how this app performs in Chrome, where these, all this stuff is, is supported with a native one, this is how that one performs. And if the native one is better, that would be an interesting thing for people to push browser makers to actually get more impl- uh, involved into implementing them. I think it's hard for developers, too, because they, they want to get into some of these concepts and these, these new things that are happening. But then they look at Polymer, and Polymer has been tested, and you know they, they have tooling around it so that you can build applications for production you know, you, you can you can build applications with XTag, and it lowers the boilerplate. It lowers the barrier of entry. But but yeah, I mean, using those native things, uh, having having like vanilla components, you can you know, ten years from now, it's still going to work the way that it, that it was. It doesn't not dependent on a version. It's not dependent on a a library. It's not dependent on a framework. It's just going to be there. It's the old problem yeah, think, of like, why should I use why should I use clean HTML? The browser fixes it for me anyways. Everything could be a diff and it works. Why should I use headlines? Why should I use a, uh, input elements? Why should a button be a button? It works in my browser, doesn't it? And that longevity, as you said, from ten years from now, it will work, is something that is a good message. But I I think for busy new developers and people who just want to build things, that messaging really doesn't work. Like a, a seventeen year old kid that wants to roll out the next uh, page to win TechCrunch with is not going to get interested what's going to happen in 10 years' time with their application, because most exactly. of them will be gone. So, sorry, Owen, you, you were saying? Um, yeah, I was saying I think the vanilla, the vanilla interoperability thing is super important. Um, like, if, if, if at the end of the day, if I'm using X tags or something, and, and I want to use a Polymer component, I'm probably not going to use it, because it then means I have to have Polymer on my page, and that's extra script parts, and it's just overhead for me. So, I think the, where, where web components will really flourish is where we start to, uh, aside from what framework you decide to use to assemble your web application, you can just pull these, these high quality components off the shelf and they'll just work, work within your workflow. I think we're kind of approaching it uh, as I think to think that um, a, a web components are only useful to build frameworks on top of is kind of the wrong angle to be looking at this from. Um, and to your point, uh, talking about what Chris was saying, how we need to make the components easier to write, I think there's a, um, I think there's there's two audiences I see for web components. There's the authors who will be probably very professional developers producing very high quality components that want to share their work with as many people as possible, and then you get users who are maybe just writing their first web page or their first web app that can now start to write um, very high quality applications with just declaratively assembling HTML on their page from components that have been written by very uh, um, very experienced developers. So I always see this two two audiences to this, and um, I think it's interesting to see how how we can uh, how we can help the web flourish by by satisfying those two audiences. What do you guys really think of something? I'm sorry, go ahead. One thing I really got excited about were the Polymer uh, components that are like a Google login or a Google map, uh, like the data-driven ones, because uh, it, it, this is something that, you know, if a, if a Facebook like button were some, some random HTML or some random uh, uh, JavaScript include but were a web component, that would be an interesting thing for people to start getting into it and understanding that these things are around. 
like something that has that is in use all over the web. And it's funny because I mean, when we talked about it, the only use of web components or, or custom elements that people keep quoting is the t the date time element inside GitHub, which is like whoopie do, well done, you know, like what? <laughs> so, but with uh, somebody like a like button or a Twitter button being a web component, that would be a good advertisement for web components. I'll tell you the that was um, very early on three years ago when we started the meetings with Dimitri and you know Alex and all these guys over at Google. Um, that was actually the number one use case that they were trying to solve. Um, yeah. They brought it up as like it was horrendous. Um, their performance teams were like looking at it and seeing like 50 nested iframes inside of a you know a little HTML that stands for um, a Facebook like button and all sorts of craziness that goes on. And it was actually that um, need to solve. And then it also brought up the idea of the encapsulation. You talked about the script, the script encapsulation that I think Apple has been really really pushing for. Um, with allowing a you know enclosed um, impermeable barrier to uh, to a script scope, um, and that was another reason why they were thinking that that was important. So yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. <laughs> yeah, it's like on custom elements I/O. Uh, when I remember when I first looked at it, there was like less than a hundred on there, and there was a lot of them were those buttons, right, in different variants. And some of them too, like like I I'm I'm one of the the maintainers for um, you know, and Justin as well for like a social elements with Polymer. So a lot of them are are Polymer that we have um, because people just use the API and they wrap it and it's and it's easier. Um, but some of the APIs actually create an iframe whether you want it to or not. Yeah. So it's interesting you say that. Well, the well, problem think... with the Facebook like button is if you got to have more use cases for designing a web cons component spec than that, because if that that is utterly trivial to implement, give me five minutes, you know, to implement this, right? Yes. Yeah. So, 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 so this fighting is like, words, fighting words. So this you is like a web. But then my point is, this is a simple web component to implement. So yes, you can absolutely do this on top of the vanilla <laughs> web component spec today, very easily. But what about the what about the person that wants to build like the data grid, with but sortable that's, that's columns fine. and all this kind of stuff? You, yes, you can do it on top of vanilla web components, but it is a lot of work, and there are a number of features probably missing from the web component spec that would make building these more complex types of components much easier if they were there. But, so, another thing I've noticed too is is people will build these giant components and not think to separate pieces. Like, if I'm thinking of a data grid, I'm thinking of cells, I'm thinking of columns, I'm thinking of these separate oh, pieces. Absolutely, but you don't use a cell outside of a, out of a grid. So, yeah, yeah, you modularize your, your component in that way, for sure, but people use the whole thing together. But people, uh, now, I bring this up because this is the most highly requested component that we receive as a community. People are ready to throw money ridiculous amounts of money at us for the for the data grid component and so I, I bring it up because this is an example of a real-world component that is non-trivial that there are tens of thousands of businesses out there that want and so and we have lots of widget libraries that try to break that problem already and ran into lots of performance problems on the web. I mean, using .NET, uh, YUI Grid, uh, uh, Sencha, all of these things have these kind of components and are not simple. But I think it's kind of a defeatist. Uh, I, I mean, I understand where you're coming from. No, my point is that the specs need to be designed to account for, if you're really going to build a component model for the web, you're going to have to be able to handle the Like Me button but you're also going to have to be able to handle the data grid and everything in between. I think so I don't think that even vanilla web components is, I mean, the problem with vanilla web components is you can't use them without a polyfill anyways. The second problem is that they're actually already really complicated. If you look at Shadow DOM, Shadow DOM is enormously complicated already. And so we've got something we can't use in every browser, but that if we could, it's enormously complicated but still does not meet the needs of a lot of these real world scenarios. So that's 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 my issue. I think we need to basically get some use cases and we need to start trying to build things and we need to see what where where does it fall down? But this is what we just had. I mean, the question was like, how can we make them more visible? And I say like, okay, when you say like a like button is very simple to implement, why does nobody do it? 
Like if we don't have maybe these because things it's out too there, simple. I don't know. <laughs> if we don't have these things out there, then we will never get to the question of the grid implementation in web components because people never think of these solutions. They keep using their Sencha UI or XJS or these kind of things to do grid components with that. And we well, maybe those developers have a deadline to meet to build an app. I mean, what you need is a set of developers that have no budgetary constraints. They can just sit around and build things for the heck of it. So the majority of people out there have a timeline that they have to, you know, it's the real world. I got to be released in three weeks. I need a data grader. I need a this. So like, I don't have time to play around with this. You know. So I think I think we're we're kind of um, combining several things though, right? Like like I look at your 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 ask, which I actually have felt a similar need for basically a Pinterest list, right? We have uneven height columns, but that that is actually um, projects the elements LTR instead of top to bottom. Right, like, like to me, we have CSS columns right now, and that has the look of exactly what I want, except if I'm having a time-ordered list, it lists things like this. So it doesn't work, right? But that's not a components problem. That's a CSS and layout problem that we can solve completely separate from components. So I don't want to pack everything in and say everything um, is a web components issue that might actually be an issue of we don't have the proper style. Um, we have the proper style API. Oh, oh I agree. I agree. You know, like, a lot of these I, things overlap. So I get what you're saying. Let's call out the component use cases because the components call out the use case, right? I need a Pinterest list, and to me, to a top level developer, you're you're going to think that's the component. And what we need to do is have the the browser vendors take that digest that top level need and say, oh, you know what, they want a Pinterest list. What that really is is we already have the hooks on the component side for like the life cycle, but we need to give them the style APIs they need to be able to fulfill that layout, right? Like, they, and so I think that's actually the missing piece. We, we are not doing a use case driven approach for dissecting the needs for the lower level platform for like the extend the web forward and um, the, the you know, manifesto that we have out now to be able to give people low level unblack boxed APIs. We need to do more of that from a use case driven perspective. But to put it all into the web components bucket kind of unduly encumbers the basic APIs we need to just get out there to make web components work. Yeah, because I mean, when web components first were first introduced by Google like three years ago, they were, the spec was massive, right? We had like a huge shadow DOM spec, we had spec for multiple shadow routes, we had, um, we had custom elements, we had HTML imports, we had the template tag, we had the MDV thing that we met didn't end up getting spec. Like there was so much stuff, and then Apple took one look at it. Like all the other vendors took one, just like whoa, we're not implementing. That's what the hell is this? This is so much stuff. Like so, as I, over the last three years, and especially the last six months, we've seen the specs being reined in and in and in, and like distilled down to their what it like the action absolute essence. And they need to be at the absolute essence and not in order for us to get agreement from these vendors. If we don't get agreement from these vendors, it's always just going to be Chrome that ships them. And then we're in a situation where no one jumps on board and starts playing with it. Um, so, so our job now is just to really cut away everything and just deliver the pieces that will really, really empower the community. Um, so Shadow DOM is one thing that's finally finally reached consensus um, between um, Mozilla, Microsoft, Google, and Apple have all said, okay, we agree on this direction for Shadow DOM. And then for me, that's like, Shadow DOM is the most important piece of web components. It, it provides something that cannot be polyfilled and provides features that will really change the way our development works. We're still hacking out custom elements, but that's something that can be polyfilled. Um, Do you think so, tooling would help there? Because I mean, the Shadow DOM problem was always that, like, it was this thing that people didn't know. And when developer tools started allowing me to dive into a video element and see the shadow root of it, then developers started understanding much more what's going on there, rather than telling them you can create your own element inside the other element. But did you even know what a select box looked like in the browser and what under the hood was created? So uh, yeah, I think it's a really powerful tool for yeah. for getting people excited. It, it, one of the things that comes up time and time again in spec meetings is like let's explain the platform. Like let's explain how the select box is done. Let's explain how the video tag is done. And that's one of the reasons why going back to like I said earlier, the synchronous constructor thing and um, and and using Shadow DOM for for native controls. Um, so I think that's super important. Yeah. And if we can if 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 developers can inspect stuff and go, ah, oh, that's how the browsers make the the slider components, the range uh, input. 
they'd be like, ah, oh, yeah, I can do that too. And it, it seems like it's, it, it, it works for them, so it should work for me type thing. I think, I think that's a powerful message. What's very one of our coworkers, one of our coworker, uh, sorry, one of the uh, Google developer experts, um, Justin and I, uh, Conrad created this um, dev tools thing that'll watch custom elements. So um, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. So I think there's developers out there that are doing some interesting stuff with that. Do you think that the community can do more? What can we do to help, you know, drive more awareness and uh, support? This I stuff. think all all we need right now is is buy-in from vendors. We need we need people to uh, like you're only going to use a polyfill if you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, right? You're like I'll use this polyfill because it's a short-term thing, and this thing will be landing in the next I don't know six months. So vendors, yeah, so the vendors first, and then the community yeah, and I think, start to help yeah, more. once because we like when everyone was speaking about web components, like Christian was talking about, they were on every um, every conference track, and everyone was talking about them. And the, the promise is like two, three years later, the promise has just failed to be fulfilled. Um, so everyone's just like, oh, screw that. I'm not, I, like, I was super excited two years ago, but now I, I've given up on it. So then it's going to be hard to regain that trust. Um, but what we're, once, once uh, developers can rely on this technology, we'll see, we'll, see some of the, we'll see some interesting things come out and we'll see web components arriving in the wild. And then that will slowly regain the trust. And then I think we'll see people start to use them more. Um, but it all hinges on this. Can we just get the core API? All, all, all we need really is shadow DOM and custom elements everywhere, and then we can start to see people create some really cool things. Um, I would love to see some talks about people analyzing what's in the browser with developer tools and showing the shadow root of a video element, for example. Or like, as you said, a range component. You know, we 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 had a big success in YUI when we anal when we gave talks about like how we did a slider component and how we actually chose the different parts of it and how it was built. Uh, having inside talks about how how browsers internally use Shadow DOM, it, I think is one that I haven't seen much. A lot of it was like, yeah, now I create a, a super button that inherits from another button and it's now a green background. Well done. But like showing how a range or or a select box works. Is, would be an interesting thing to tell people because a lot of people assume that you can build these things and they're not easy. They're really not yeah. easy to build components in the browser that way. So getting more insight into that one would be a new uh, a renaissance of web components talks, I think, rather than just like promises, as you said, like, oh, this will be the future, learn it now, and then it didn't become the future. So one of the interesting things in Firefox is that uh, we're not yet using... Um, web components for the browser internals. We're using uh, something called XBL, which uh, I only found out recently was actually what the web component spec was built on. So XBL is like a markup language very similar to HTML. It has JavaScript and stuff, and all the concepts of shadow DOM and custom tags um, were already part of this language called XBL. Um, XBL2 was, was spec, and actually Dimitri then based the whole web component spec on top of XBL2, which I didn't know about. Um, so, it's, so what we have inside Firefox is like real use cases of how web components would be used, um, but in XBL. Um, and then we have people in, who have long, have actually a lot of experience using these web, these not web components, but web components in production. And they're coming to the spec meetings and saying, "This does work. This doesn't work." So that's really that's really good to have that feedback. And then the dream is if one, once we get this web components spec'd out fully, then we can replace these XBL parts with real HTML, JavaScript, CSS, and, and we can have the same inspect story that Chrome has. It's a bit like the, in, in, in Flash and in uh, Flex, we had all these kind of things, and a lot of these learnings have been lost and uh, because of like religious wars of like uh, uh, open web versus Flash. It's a kind of a shame that, that uh, kind of these thinkings were not there. Or it would be an interesting one to, to take, for example, all the data grids of all the widget libraries and analyze all of them and see like how hard it would be to actually turn that into a native web component. You know, these kind of things would be interesting to, to analyze what people are using right now and how much that would work for a specified one or a, a, a standardized one. Yeah, yeah. Awkward silence. <laughs> I'm supposed to jump in at this point. <laughs> uh, so I guess my main, the main point that I would want to get across is there was there was a big hype about web components and everybody was just really excited at the beginning. I think it's because there's universal agreement 
about the concept of web components. Everybody thinks this, this is a good idea. Everybody wants this. But I still believe that there are a lot of problems in the implementations and the specifications. And so, in my opinion, I think that in the last, if I had to guess, the reason it's fallen off is because people finally have started to dig in and realize that, oh my goodness, it's harder than I thought it was going to be, or oh, I thought it was going to have, for example, oh, I thought it was going to have feature X, and it doesn't, or, and so then they get maybe less excited because they realize uh, there's still a lot of hard work, or there's just platform things obstructing them. I have a very long list of my own personal problems with all of the specs, which we don't have time to go into, but I had a few big picture issues I'd like to just enunciate. Do you have a, any, do you have any examples? Let me just do a few high-level things because I think, in my opinion, I'm all for web components, but I feel like it's probably worth it to take a step back and try and address more general issues with the DOM. As a, as a primary example, say you've got Shadow DOM and you want to implement your web component. That's all fine and good. You can do that. But the layout engine of the browser is still a black box. And oftentimes, you want your web component to render itself different, not based off of the screen size, not based off of current media queries, but based off of how much space it has for itself alone. And so, I mean, this is just, if I think about a component model, again, this has nothing to do with the current web component specs. But when I think about building components, if I'm going to build a truly reusable component, my component needs to be able to render itself. Um, and it's, its layout logic needs to sort of be encapsulated. It can't be dependent on the screen size because the developer may have chosen to put it in a 50 by 50 box instead of a 300 by 300 box or a full page box. And it has nothing to do with the, the media, if you will. It has nothing to do with whether I'm running on a tablet, per se. It has to do with its ability to render in the space that it's given. So for example, this is an, this is an example of a fundamental problem uh, just around CSS and the DOM with the fact that the, that the rendering, the layout engine of the browser is completely a black box and the only way to get into that is by extending CSS with more and more and more box models. There's no way uh, to tap into any kind of feature that says I want to lay out different based on my available space or any of this kind of thing. I mean, there's proposals for element queries, but it's not in there. But so to me, this is not a this is not to do with the the current set of web component specs. But this is like a core DOM, a CSS ish type feature that actually relates very very strongly to be able to create to successfully create web components that actually can be reused in a variety of different applications. Um, so, so I it think. Sounds like Sounds like you're, the problem you're explaining is the problem that the Houdini project is trying to solve, which is yeah. um, actually delving into how can we explain CSS, how can we get people to extend CSS. Right. Which uh, is it's, it's a really hard problem to solve because no, that, black I, I, box is, that black box is exactly how it makes it easy for us to uh, spec stuff. You can just say, this is the syntax, and this is how, this is how it should do, how it should... Uh, this oh, I'm not, should, uh, I'm not disagreeing with that, but yeah, I'm, yeah. now I'm saying, okay, let's think about people that are going to write web components, yeah. and so there are they yeah, have there to are render, and they don't know where they're where they're rendering at. You know, they don't they don't know. Yeah. They have that's just a part of writing a, a truly reusable component. Um, so I would say let's let's think about how can we give people access to the layout engine in some way that they can actually encapsulate their their components from that perspective. I think things like accessibility, like we need better accessibility APIs just in the mm -hmm. core platform so that people can build these web components that don't have to inherit from some built-in component in order to get the property accessibility behavior. So like we need yeah. to, and this is again, it's not part of the web component spec, but this is just a general improvement that would be fantastic for the DOM as a whole. Um, that was one of my main, my main disappointments because I totally loved the idea of inheriting from a button and making it to something else and getting all the accessibility goodness of a button in your, inside your component. And then this is now being dropped, the, the is equals whatever uh, subclassing because it's a hard thing to implement. But I, I'm, I think you're getting into like from 10 to 10,000 to 100,000 here. Like, I mean, we will not be able to, to fix the DOM and the CSS and replace it with something else retro 
proactively for all the browsers out there. At times, we have something that is already rolled out there, and some parts of the component you, you have will have a hard time to, uh, to re-implement. Also, I'm, I'm not quite sure if we really have that many developers really excited to start writing their own CSS and rendering, or wanting to know how a thing renders. The only thing that developers are, uh, are worried about is that their stuff renders slowly on the web, and uh, we, have to, we have to fix that. And instead of just, uh, I mean, if you want to go into rendering, you can actually write parts of the browser, or you can write WebGL, or you can write OpenGL, then you have directly access to the video hardware and all these kind of features. So I'm really wondering if, like, I'm not saying that this is not important things. They are very important things. I just wonder who the audience of that is. Like, we have millions of web developers out there who would benefit from being able to actually put, uh, put components into their pages that do more than HTML5 has. Or to have, like, their company header with the links and the buttons and everything and put that into a custom element that a, custom, that a CMS, for example, could then use as one element rather than just having to have it as, like, 10,000 div elements and changing it accordingly when every new browser comes out. So the componentization on the platform itself is something that we stop talking about and we get more excited into like how do we replace the DOM, how do we replace CSS because it's all broken. Yes it is, but it's also all distributed. I'm not talking about replacing any of that, but I'm talking about don't we have missing features in terms of accessibility and wouldn't that be great for not just web component scenarios but a whole host of just general web development? But wouldn't that make web components better as well? So shouldn't we look at improving the accessibility APIs? Shouldn't we look at improving layout, at least with something maybe like element queries? Yeah. So, 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 so these that, are all, these yeah. are like parallel tracks. These are parallel. No, but that's, this is my point. So I, I, I guess my point is, when you go to design web components, you might design them differently if the f core platform actually had some of these features that are not there yet that would actually benefit not only web components but a broader range of scenarios. Better integration with ES6. Reimagine web components with ES6 as a baseline. You know, reimagine web components with, uh, with the, the access, uh, accessibility APIs. Reimagine them with some new layout features. And these features in the core DOM, improving the core DOM, would affect many more scenarios, but would also make for a better uh, web component spec as well. I mean, had building web components on top of that would be better. In my I mean, we had, we had, for example, the widget specification, which allows you to build applications on terms of, on terms of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to, that ran outside the browser. Opera used them since Opera 5 or something like that. We had HTAs in Internet Explorer 4. We had like all these things were already, we tried that so many times and I think it's a very important part and you're very much right with the accessibility APIs. One of the things we're pushing inside the team here right now is uh, we wrote a polyfill for the outline algorithm of the browser because nobody uses that one. Like having H1 to H6 and having sections and, uh, and, uh, uh, and articles and these kind of things, no browser does anything with that outline algorithm. That's why people don't write uh, a semantic HTML because there's no benefit from it. And the same with you, that when you say, like, if we had a richer way to interact with things with accessibility, for example, if your component could get voice input, if your component could have proper voice output, these kind of, uh, the Cortana APIs, for example, being available in JavaScript right now, something like that as a specified part of a component spec would be interesting. But that goes, uh, as, uh, as Wilson said, uh, that's, uh, as Owen said, that's actually going into, into parallel tracks, because the other thing, of course, is, like, uh, um, uh, hardware APIs is the other big thing as well. Like, if your component can do things like uh, an image upload without having to write it, great. This would be a very simple thing to do. I, a drag and drop into a file upload, the file up upload component is terrible at the moment. Like, it doesn't have chunked uploads, it doesn't have timed uploads, these kind of things. These would be things that are very nice to do. I still am, uh, I still am wondering about the question, like, it's three years have gone and we cannot use the web components yet the way they are. Is it, about, is it time to admit defeat and say, like, okay, the specification was too grandiose, was too complex? Or is, as you said, should we rethink it and it wasn't, uh, it was just solving a problem that we didn't really have. 
and people didn't jump on because it was too hard to implement natively right now and maybe it's a good opportunity now to open that even wider and say like what about the accessibility of it, what about the extensibility of it, what about taking ES6 as the, uh, as the baseline but then but of course we have to, we have to make ES6 better and, and more let's be, clear that, let's be clear that for the first time in three years we actually have buy-in from all four <laughs> major measures. That's something that would explain why we haven't had these things adopted um, so I think yeah, I guess now, at some point so. you have to ship though, right? At some point you have to draw a line in the sand and say we have to try something, otherwise the platform never moves. I guess it just seems kind of ridiculous to me to have ES6 and then to have a a, a component model based off of ES5. You know, <laughs> I, mean, well, I mean, every browser that's going to have web components is already going to have the ES6 features by the time they roll out, probably, right? I mean, you're referring to modules. Yeah, modules and classes are the primary two obvious things. I mean, I know that there is some consideration around that now, but I mean, back to the HTML imports issue. I mean, it just seems silly not to integrate that with with the ES6 module loader. I mean, so imports are kind of no other vendor other than Google has buy in, has bought in for import has has buy in right. for imports. So right, right, uh, right. The imports on they're not spec. They're just a they're just a proposal from Google and. And people have like rolled quite far with them, um, but we haven't seen any other vendor interested in them yet. So I'm not sure where they go now. Um, so we're just looking at custom elements and shadow DOM. That's the only well, thing. There was a patch for Mozilla that didn't land, right? For imports. Yeah. So the yeah. Tracker. But it just it, yeah. it was. But there was a design choice, right? You guys made a design yeah, choice. Yeah, that was actually one six. of the reasons why. We we backed away from imports is because there was just so many holes in the spec. Um, it was just I don't know. It was riddled with problems, and and we decided to take a step step away, go and way discuss them. Um, actually, seeing if they solved problems that users needed um, that that normal JS wouldn't solve. Um, and and in the effort to distill this stuff right back and actually get buy-in from everyone, it was one of the easiest things to to drop um, with. With, and and they didn't seem like it enabled anything that couldn't already be done, um, so that was one of the re one of the things. All right, we are pushing up against time. I'm sorry. Maybe we could do a, uh, a second one of these, because uh, I know Rob has ton more stuff, <laughs> um, which would be great to get to. So I'll write a blog post. That I I have a huge list of uh, beefs with different specs. <laughs> <laughs> All That's right. good. So, blog posts are good. Don't just write a tweet and, and, and tell people to fix it. Blog posts are good. Explain things. Yeah. I have got yeah. blog posts and presentations at conferences lined up on this very topic. <laughs> It'll be out there, trust me. <laughs> it might, so it might not it might not enthuse people to use web components, so sorry about that. Um, but maybe oh, it's, it'll good motivate. Different, it's good to get different opinions on it though. I mean we need that in the web community, right? If everybody thought the same, we wouldn't be we wouldn't be having these discussions. I think it's beautiful that we're at the end of the hype curve of web components right now. Like the, the, the marketing spiel doesn't work anymore. People are not believing the thing that it is the future that already works because you need to use one browser in a, in a pre-built alpha so you can actually use them. <laughs> and now we're actually in the stage where we, where we can discuss how to make that thing really work. And uh, I, I wish that hype curve with a lot of technologies that we use like that dies much, much quicker. Because right now we have this competition to be on Hacker News and to be like on, on Reddit and Stack Overflow and win everything and be the coolest thing ever. And then f a half a year later we start actually thinking about like, hey, how does that actually work and how can we use it? We get far too excited about impressing each other with like, uh, uh, as I said in one talk, I, I remember when JavaScript didn't start with a logo. And nowadays it actually does. Like everything has a logo and a great branding and it's just a polyfill for a little problem. And I wish we would stop trying to impress one another and actually think about more implementing it. And that's where I'm agreeing with Rob that it's a good decision to think about, like, why don't we paste it on ES6? Every new API that comes on the browser right now is promises-based. That already assumes an ES6 uh, support. So why not think about that one? But again, I don't want to lose the simplicity of the original implementation of web components. I don't want to lose the uh, writing an element to actually use the component. I just don't want to be the, that to be another JavaScript interface that you have to know a lot of class-based JavaScript to actually start writing your own first component, because that would make it useful. Yeah. Well, Chris, if, if people want to find you, uh, what's your Twitter? 
code poet, C-O-D-E-P-O number eight. Okay. And Rob? Uh, Eisenberg effect. And Wilson? Uh, I'm Wilson Page. P-A-G. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming. Sorry we got a, we got a jet, but I uh, appreciate it. Thanks very much. Have a lovely cool. day. Thanks, everybody. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.